Uh, good morning, all. It is Wednesday, February 24th. Uh, we are knee deep into our immune response. Uh, so we are going to continue our discussion of our body defenses today, uh, talking primarily about our third line of defense. Again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you're going to get a lot of this in micro as well. So we'll cover it to the depth that I'm going to cover it. And then anything that's lacking, I know uh, your micro teacher will cover for us. Um, we've got a couple assignments left. Your Physio X Exercise 12, Activity 3, and only Activity 3 is due on Monday. Uh, on Wednesday, your Labster uh, uh, Intro to Immunology is due, uh, and that's again 100% uh, complete and at least 80% correct for full credit on that. I don't normally like having assignments due uh, on days that we're not in class, but since we are online, I figured we can take advantage of that a little bit. So rather than having them due on Wednesday the 3rd, I've given you a couple extra days to complete your outlines. Of course, if you get them completed early, then feel free to submit them. Uh, but your group presentation outlines are due by 6 p.m. on Fridays. Then not at 6 p.m., but by 6 p.m. So when they're done, turn them in. Again, it is important that these be available for everybody over the weekend to study from and to look at. So again, it will be harshly penalized if it is late. No excuses, no computer issues, none of that. Uh, again, there's no reason you have to wait to the last minute to turn them in. And when you wait for the last minute, you are at the whims of the almighty electrical world uh, and all of the problems that could come along with that. And then that following week, like I said, you guys are on display. Uh, group presentations on Monday and then on Wednesday, the lab and lecture exam. All right. So again, nothing new there. Everything we talked about already. So we've got the game plan. Any questions on that? So I thought you were being serious, Christopher, because I saw all of that, but apparently everybody's still asleep. It's one of those kind of mornings, I guess. All righty. Let's go here. So we left off last time and we had started our introduction to our third line of defense, our specific defense, our adaptive immunity. Uh, that is, uh, again, precise. It's the scalpel that we talked about. And as we also mentioned, the reason this is able to, uh... oh, excellent. Uh, it is the reason it is able to be precise is a concept that we started talking about way back when we were talking about blood typing. And that is this concept of antigens. Antigens are these identification tags that are on the surface of our cells. I said most of them are proteins, uh, but they can have also lipid or even carbohydrate components to them. And as we talked about, these are the tags that allow us to tell whether a cell is us or not. Now, when we talk about antigens, and again, most things have them on them, uh, antigens can either be complete or incomplete. A complete antigen basically has two main requirements. So let's think in terms of a virus. We have a virus and that virus has a particular uh, antigen on its surface. The first thing we want to have happen is that a lymphocyte, one of our immune cells, needs to be able to recognize that antigen. Right? This can occur uh, basically by some type of uh, antibody-like receptor. So we've got our little Ys here with our binding site, and it's able to identify that. Now, most lymphocytes, when they identify a harmful pathogen, uh, the thing that they do is they divide rapidly, making lots of new, new cells. This is one of the big differences between our immune response and those natural killer cells. Remember the natural killer cells were lymphocytes. Uh, they were the security guards that went around and found things that killed them, but it was just the one of them right? That was there by itself, having to do it all by itself. In our adaptive immunity, when that lymphocyte is activated, it divides, producing a bunch of clones. And those clones basically have the exact same uh, specificity to that exact same antigen as before. So to be a complete antigen, we want it to be able to stimulate our lymphocyte 
And then also, once we get these clones of the lymphocyte, we want these clones to be able to react and respond and ultimately lead to the destruction of it. So notice there's two things we needed to do. We needed to stimulate the lymphocyte and we needed to be able to respond to the clones of that lymphocyte as well. Now, of course, we're gonna have fancy names for these things, so of course we are. That ability to stimulate a lymphocyte is a characteristic we call immunogenicity. So this is that ability of a antigen to stimulate a particular lymphocyte to divide. And then the ability of those divided lymphocytes to be able to then respond to uh, or react to that antigen is what we call reactivity. So again, they give fancy names to these things, but it's a pretty simple and basic concept. We want it to be able to stimulate uh, the immune response. And then once we stimulate that immune response, we want our immune response to be able to interact with it. And that's what we want in a complete antigen. The problem is there are things known as incomplete antigens. Right. Now, there are lots of other small molecules running around inside of our bodies as well, like the dander of your pets, right? The uh, pollen of the uh, plants outside, the dust, uh, from all the skin of all the people living in the same house with you, especially since you've been in the same house with these people for a year and nobody's leaving the house. So just imagine the amount of uh, dead skin cells that are all over the place. There are all these small molecules that get ingested and interact with our body and come into our body, but they don't react to it. They're not immunogenic. They don't stimulate an immune response. However, some of those things, like the pet dander, like the pollen, right, things that like the proteins from a peanut, can be reactive, meaning they don't stimulate the cells to divide, but there, if there are already some immune cells there, they may interact with those immune cells. They can be reactive. And when that occurs, we get an inappropriate immune response. And so that inappropriate immune response, immune response, um, those types of small molecules that cause those inappropriate immune responses, we call incomplete antigens, or they're also known as haptins. The problem with a haptin like a pollen from uh, the cut grass, like the pet dander, like that protein from the peanut, is that those haptins have the ability to actually be able to combine with proteins in your body. And when that occurs, it triggers your body to now suddenly recognize that thing that is normal inside of you as being foreign. And it triggers that inappropriate immune response. And of course, if you haven't figured it out by now, these are the things that we typically refer to as allergies or what are also known as hypersensitivities. Now there are several classes of hypersensitivities. I'm not gonna get into them, uh, but again, this is the basic concept by how those hypersensitivities, those allergies uh, occur because our body is responding to a typically non-reactive minor molecule like the protein of a peanut, like the dander of a pet, like the pollen of the cut grass. But for some individuals, uh, it can be reactive, causing that inappropriate immune response. Obviously, this is something we want to avoid. And so the best way to avoid these types of things from a biological standpoint is to make sure that the cells of our immune response are properly trained. So we need to talk about our cells and we gotta talk about how we train them as well. All right, so this specific immunity, like I said, what we commonly refer to as our immune response. However, at the end of our last class, we talked about there isn't just one global immunity. There are lots of different types of immunity. And what type of immunity specifically did we say is what we commonly refer to as our immune response? 
that are adaptive immunity. Okay, it was adaptive. What else? Specific. True. Yeah, and those are the characteristics of it. But remember, we talked about all the different types of immunity at the end of the last class. What type of immunity was it that we said was our immune response? What we commonly think of as immune response. The things you're describing are absolutely ways that you describe our immune response. But what was the label that we gave it of all the different types of immunity that we talked about? Remember there was innate, there we go, active, naturally acquired immunity. Right, so it was that active, naturally acquired immunity is typically what we think of our immune response. We are, from our environment, exposed to a pathogen. That's what we mean by naturally, right? That pathogen interacts with our body. We're, we're acquiring it and we do the work. And when we do the work, we get the benefit from that. Now, this immune response requires basically two main branches. They are our humoral immunity. Humoral immunity is also what is known as our antibody mediated immunity. And guess what our antibody mediated immunity does? Not a trick question. Uses antibodies? Uses antibodies, absolutely. And it releases those antibodies into the fluids of the body the blood, the interstitial fluid, the lymph. That's why this is called the humoral, right? Humors are the fluids of the body. So in this way, what we're doing here is we're releasing antibodies into the humors of the body, into the fluids, let's use a different word, of the body uh, to directly affect the pathogen. This is different from our cellular immunity or what we call cell mediated immunity. In this case, rather than releasing a protein, those antibodies, these are actually cells that attack other cells. Right? Those cells can be infected cells. Those cells can be foreign cells. Those cells can be abnormal cells. And that is our cellular immunity. So we have things that attack the pathogens directly and things that are influenced by the pathogens, the cells that are influenced by it. Let's talk about the cells involved in these two branches of immunity. The first are our lymphocytes. Uh, lymphocytes, of course, are produced where? In the bone marrow. Red bone marrow, excellent. What was the primary stem cell? Lymphoid stem cell. Well, that would be the secondary. Hematopoietic. Excellent, lymphoid. And then uh, what was the primary? You said it, say it again. Hematopoietic. Well, hematopoietic, it, you right, have the right idea. That is the term we use for the making of them. But remember this, this, the actual stem cells themselves. So that was the process, the stem cells themselves. Remember the hemocytoblasts. So hemocytoblasts are the primary stem cells. Remember they're the primary stem cells for all of our formed elements of the blood. And then specifically, these are the only ones that are come from that lymphoid uh, secondary stem cell. However, these uh, immature lymphocytes, once made, migrate to one of two locations. One of those locations is to uh, migrate to the bone marrow, in the bone marrow, and those that stay in the bone marrow or travel to different bone marrow in different parts of the body are what develop into our B cells, B for bone marrow, whereas some of them will migrate to the thymus. And the ones that migrate to the thymus, of course, become the T cells. It is the B cells that are responsible for producing the antibodies, providing that humoral immunity. 
And it is the T cells that are the ones that are going to give us that hot cell on cell action uh, with that cell mediated immunity where they are gonna attack foreign and infected cells directly. Of course, lymphocytes can't do it all by themselves. Oh, although we'll do this first. Okay, excellent. I wanna make sure we're comfortable with some vocabulary. I think we've done this before, but I wanna make sure we do this now. What is the difference between an immature and a mature cell? Isn't it that like one of them is active and the other one's not active? See, what, so what do you mean by active? But, um... I like where you're going with this, but let's be a little bit more precise. Yeah, um, like ready to attack. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Re able, capable, ab ready to or capable of providing defense. capable of being stimulated, capable of doing its job. I like that a lot, absolutely. You guys got the right idea, that's perfect, right? You can take an immature lymphocyte and put it directly on, rub it on a virus, and it's not gonna be able to do anything about it. It's not capable of protecting us. However, when it is mature, and again, it's gonna mature either in the bone marrow or the thymus, and again, of course, they're gonna give a fancy name for that. When it's immunocompetent, it is capable of providing that defense for us. However, just because it's capable doesn't mean that it has experienced or done any work yet, right? You send that 18 year old to boot camp, and at the end of boot camp, you have yourself a soldier. But if that soldier never goes to war, he is still naive. And the same thing is true here. As we talked about, you have immunocompetent cells in your body prepared to defend you from all sorts of different types of diseases, like malaria, for instance. But like we talked about, if never in your life you go to someplace like Panama, you may never come in contact with that malaria. And that cell that is there with his gun, with his rifle, ready to do his job, is going to sit there for your entire life and do nothing ever because it's never actually come in contact with the pathogen that it is matured to defend us against. So immature and naive do not mean the same thing. That's really the point I wanna make. Immature means that it is not capable of producing an immune response, whereas naive means it just hasn't had an immune response yet. So I wanna make sure we understand those distinctions. Now, we do need to talk about how these cells become immunocompetent. This has primarily been studied in T cells, but from everything we know, we believe that B cells uh, mature in the exact same way. This maturation process requires about two to three days, either in the bone marrow or in the thymus. And there's two key steps in this process. All right, let's actually switch to the whiteboard where we can play a little bit. As we know, all cells in the body, as we've just finished talking about, have all sorts of different types of proteins on the surface of their cells. Some of them are the tags, like we've talked about, like antigens. Some of them can be channels. Some of them can be receptors, where like, for instance, a hormone could bind to it, causing some type of interaction, enzymes. There's all sorts of connectors, all sorts of different types of proteins that can be on the surface of a cell, all the cells in our body. One in particular, is a protein called the major histocompatibility complex. Pretty much every cell in your body has this major histocompatibility complex on its surface. And since I wrote it in black, I'll go ahead and draw it over again in black.
the job of this major histocompatibility complex is to present antigens. What this means is that it is going to, let's do it this way, hold little bits of protein inside of it and present them that way. All right, now I've put that in there, but I'm gonna move it now immediately after I've drawn in there because that's I don't wanna get to that point yet. Its job is to present antigens. So every single cell in your body has this. It is special for you and your cells. So it is gonna be important for our T cells. So if we have a T cell, and I'll just make this one square. Uh, well, let's not use that. If this is our T cell, what we need that T cell to be able to do, that's not gonna work as a, as a square. What we need this T cell to be able to do is to be able to recognize. It must have the right receptor on its surface to be able to recognize that major histocompatibility complex. If it doesn't have that, or has some wacky version that won't match up properly with it, then it's never going to be able to be activated. This cell that is not able to bind, so if it's not able to bind, major stigmatability complex, it can never be activated. What is this circle thing? It's a protein? Cells. So this is our T cell. This is so the red cell. one. That's just a normal cell in our body. Okay. okay. So if it's not able to bind to that major histocompatibility complex, it's never going to be able to be properly activated. And it's not going to do us any good. And if that's the case, we need to kill it. Because otherwise it can cause problems. This is what we call our positive selection. So this positive selection is the ability to recognize the major histocompatibility complex. All right, you with me so far? Okay, stun silence means yes, we totally understand, let's move forward, perfect. So the second part of this, as I mentioned, is that these major histocompatibility complexes jobs are to present proteins on the surface. Proteins that it gets from inside of it, proteins that it gets from outside of it. It grabs little pieces of proteins, it grabs the antigens and presents those antigens on its surface. Now, a normal healthy cell actually takes little pieces of its own proteins and basically expresses its own antigens on its surface. So while we need this T cell to recognize the major histocompatibility complex, do we want it to react with our own antigens? Well, it's not a MAC, it's the MHC, but yes, the major histocompatibility complex. Do we want our T cells to react to our own proteins? No. No, no absolutely not. So if, if the T cell has the binding site shape where it can react to our own proteins, that's a really bad thing. That means when we release it into our body, it's gonna attack our own cells. And so we don't want that. So the second thing we need is a negative selection where we have to make sure the T cell does not react to any of our proteins, antigens. Let's go ahead and use the antigens. So for instance, if this one's got the square one that matches that, that would be a bad thing and we would want to kill it. 
However, if we had a T cell, and I'm gonna have to shrink the size of this one, that had the right shape to bind to the major histocompatibility complex, but its binding site was not the shape of any of our proteins, then this would pass the positive and it would pass the negative and this one would mature and become immunocompetent. So that's our goal. Our goal is to make sure that these T cells, and again, also the B cells as well, but to make sure that these T cells can pass the positive selection and the negative selection, right? It has to be able to recognize our self protein, that major histocompatibility complex. And since I abbreviated it, I'll go ahead and write it out here. And we'll talk about these major histocompatibility complexes in much more uh, 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 detail later. So it has to be able to recognize that major histocompatibility complex, but it has to not recognize any of our antigens. It has to be what we call self-tolerant. If something was able to recognize our own antigens and was able to mature and get out into our blood, what would happen as a result of that? It would attack itself. Our, yeah, our we would have cells that would attack our own cells in our body. And what would we call that? Yeah, an autoimmune disorder. That's basically what happens with an autoimmune disorder. Yeah, I'll go back to it in a second. Just give me one moment. That is what would happen. We would get, if it, if it doesn't pass this negative selection, then what happens is it's going to attack our own cells. And that's essentially what an autoimmune disorder is. An autoimmune disorder is where we have cells that are attacking cells, recognizing cells that are in our body as being foreign and attacking them, right? Like in multiple sclerosis where it attacks the oligodendrocytes and things along those lines. All right, someone wanted to see the whiteboard again. So there you go. So that's like an autoimmune would be only if it can't pass the negative selection? No, if somehow one uh, snuck through the net without passing the negative selection, right? The point of the negative selection is to kill any T cells that do recognize us. But if somehow some T cells that recognize us sneak through or get through, or maybe they mutate after the fact, we're not really sure how exactly those autoimmune disorders occur. But basically what happens with an autoimmune disorder is a cell that should have been destroyed because it didn't pass the negative selection somehow was able to become immunocompetent. All right, now this is a very high criteria to pass for these cells and not many do. Of the lymphocytes, of the immature lymphocytes that go to the thymus, only about 2% actually survive and become immunocompetent. So 98% of the lymphocytes we're making it's a very heavy background check, absolutely. But again, this is something we want to take very, very seriously, right? How serious are conditions like multiple sclerosis? How serious are conditions like um, uh, type 1 diabetes, right? Or other types of autoimmune disorders where our body attacks our own cells, right? These are very serious conditions. And so these are dangerous cells. And we want to absolutely, I love that. They have a very, very heavy background check on these guys. Exactly. All right, so that is how we get our uh, immunocompetent lymphocytes. And of course, here's the pretty picture from the textbook that shows this process as well. But we still need other cells as well. The second main type of cells that we find in our uh, immune response are phagocytes. And which cells are the primary phagocytes again? Monocytes and neutrophils. There you go. 
monocytes and neutrophils. Excellent. Oh, and there you go, I didn't even have to write it. Excellent. Phagocytes are important because obviously they break down and destroy pathogens. All right, so they're very, very important in the process that way. Um, however, remember, as we talked about, when they break that down, remember we talked about how they'll release most of the broken down material. But most is not all. Remember how we talked about it is going to express some of the antigens from that from that uh, from that pathogen that it broke down on its surface, and we talked about how that is going to help us to stimulate an immune response. Well, because they do this, we call them antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells job is to, like the name uh, states, present foreign antigens on their surface. Obviously, phagocytes are the main examples of these antigen presenting cells, but they're not the only ones. The dendritic cells, remember that we talked about in the skin, those uh, Langerhans cells in the skin, they can present antigens on their surface. Remember, they're somewhat phagolytic. They also contain histamine. Uh, that's what causes the redness when you get the poison ivy or the poison oak or something like that on your skin, hives, things along those lines. A cell that is infected, remember, is being forced to make proteins that are not its own. And since a cell normally expresses its own proteins on the surface, if it's making abnormal proteins inside of it, it will express those abnormal proteins. And it can be doing that because it's infected. Uh, it can also be doing that uh, because it is cancerous, right? A cell that is cancerous will be making abnormal proteins and can uh, be expressing it on the surface. Uh, transplanted cells. Right, you get that new uh, liver for Christmas because you've been drinking vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 17 years. And so as a result of that, you get a new liver and the liver presents its normal antigens on its surface. The problem is we don't recognize it. And so our immune cells could actually attack that infected cell because of that. Uh, we haven't talked too much about the liver yet. We know magic happens in there. We talked about that in the uh, cardiovascular system. Part of that magic is having a special cell in their capillaries called Kufer cells, which if you think about it, it makes sense. All the food from our digestive system that we ingest goes first to our liver to be processed. So anything that comes in from our digestive system needs to be checked for harmful or abnormal uh, materials there. So that can be gobbled up and those can present wow. them. And even our B cells, as we'll learn, uh, can be antigen presenting cells. And we'll see how that works a little bit later. And of course, as we talked about, all of these antigen presenting cells present these antigens on their major histocompatibility complexes. as we said, all cells have these major histocompatibility complexes and are going to use them to express these antigens. Let's see a little of how this works. All right, now, in talking about our two different types of immunity, uh, humoral and cellular, we're gonna start with cellular because cellular typically is the branch of your immune response that gets activated first. Again, this is the one that's gonna use the T cells. And this is the one that is going to give us that, like I said, that hot cell on cell action. 
right? They are providing a defense against abnormal and infected cells. Here we have kind of the birth tree for these T cells. And we see that there are different types of T cells that can be activated, starting from first the ones that mature in the bone marrow versus those that mature in the uh, thymus. These are the ones that mature in the thymus and then they become different types of C cells. And we'll talk about all of this in a second. But what you can see from this illustration is there's basically four main types of T cells. There are the helper T cells. Guess what helper T cells do? Help. There you go, they help. They're the ones that help to enhance all of our uh, uh, body defenses. Our cytotoxic T cells, which are also sometimes affectionately referred to as the killer T cells. These are the ones that actually destroy those abnormal or infected cells. Remember, one of the strengths of our immune response is that memory, that ability to, if we're exposed to a pathogen a second time, have a much more aggressive, faster, stronger, and longer response. And it is those memory cells that help to allow us to do that. And once we get all these cells revved up and running, ready to kill other cells in our body, do we wanna let them running around killing stuff in our body forever? Yeah. No, it's important that they kill stuff when there's harmful pathogens infecting and destroying our cells, right? But we don't want them staying turned on forever. So we are gonna need either what are known as suppressor or also known as regulatory T cells to help to turn the system off after it's been activated. Now, like I said, we're talking about cell mediated immunity first because it's typically the cell mediated branch that is activated before the humoral is. But if you remember, we have a bit of an issue. The T cells don't interact directly with the pathogen, right? Antibodies interact directly with the pathogen, but cell mediated T cells interact with cells. So for our T cells to be activated, they need those antigen presenting cells. So it is the antigen presenting cells that are going to activate the T cells. And what kind of cells did we say were activate? The antigen presenting cells again? Dendritic cells, phagocytes, um, sometimes B cells. Excellent, right, absolutely. So phagocytes are one of the big ones. That kind of includes the Coover cells and the dendritic cells because those have phagolytic characteristics to it, uh, but also infected cells themselves. Yes, B cells, but we'll come back to B cells in a bit as well. Primarily, these are the two we want to look at. We want to look at these phagocytes and we look, want to look at these infected cells because these are basically the two main classes uh, that are going to be presenting uh, these antigens. And as we've kind of hinted at, we have this double recognition where we need to have that T cell recognize both a self component and a non self component both the cell's protein, which we already know is going to be that major histocompatibility complex, and the specific antigen for our pathogen. Now, I make a point of emphasizing, uh, grab this, do that, the phagocytes and the infected cells, because there are two main classes of major histocompatibility complexes that will be expressed by these two main types of cells. All right, let's switch back to our, oh, let me see what the next page looks like. I think I wanna go back to our whiteboard. Yeah, I do, I wanna go back to our whiteboard. All right, so let's do this.
Here is a nice, happy, normal cell. in our body. As we know, this normal, happy, healthy cell is going to express what we call the type one, and we'll use Roman numerals because it makes it look more fancy, major histocompatibility complex. Okay, so this is most cells in the body. I don't either. So this expresses our major histocompatibility complex and we'll put it on the surface like this. All right? There is our major histocompatibility complex type one. Now, like all proteins, protein expression on a cell is dynamic. this a little smaller so I can fit it where I want. What this means is proteins are constantly being expressed on the surface of the plasma membrane and then withdrawn from the surface of the plasma membrane. We're constantly expressing all of these on the surface. And in a normal healthy cell, what happens is this major histocompatibility complex when it is inside the cell just grab some random us antigen. And when it grabs that random us antigen, and then it expresses it on its surface, we're just expressing one of our antigens. And since it's one of our antigens and our T cells have passed their negative selection, should that activate our T cell? No, our T cells should not respond to our antigens. All right, we comfortable with that? But then something interesting happens. And that interesting thing that happens is that this normal healthy cell gets infected by a virus. As we know, when this cell is infected by a virus, it starts making viral uh, uh, proteins. And some of those viral proteins, I need to erase that, may then be expressed on the surface. So suddenly now that major histocompatibility complex is grabbing a foreign antigen and it is expressing that foreign antigen on its surface. Notice when it is doing this, it now has two parts to it. It has a self part and it will, which actually, hold on, let's do it this way. A non self part, which should be red. And we'll go ahead and remind ourselves that the self part is black. So we've got a self part and a non-self part. So our type one major histocompatibility complex is expressing a non-self antigen. And notice this is an internal antigen. This is an antigen that this cell made. Are you with me so far? Yeah. It gets worse from here. So if this doesn't make sense, now's the time to ask. If this is confusing, if you're having trouble with this, now is the time to ask these questions because it's going to get worse. So why is there one on the surface and one inside? Uh, what I was trying to represent with the one inside is that these are proteins that are being made by our body, our cell. 
like many proteins that are made from our cell, these are expressed onto the surface of the cell and then brought back into the surface of the cell. The proteins on the surface of the cell don't stay there forever. So we're constantly bringing them in and putting them out. So when this one is in here inside the cell, it just picks up some random thing inside the cell that it finds. Some random thing that it finds inside the cell that's being made by the cell, that internal antigen will bind to it so that when it is expressed on the surface, it shows that internal antigen that it found and bound to. So it bound it here and then it expressed it on the surface. That was all I was trying to represent. So I was trying to show how it's gonna bind this antigen inside and then it is gonna express it on the surface. And then where did the not self part come from? Like it picked it up somewhere? Right, because remember what's happening now is this cell is infected. Remember when a cell is infected by the virus, that virus makes the cell make proteins to make more viruses so that it can burst the cell and release those viruses and continue the spread. So when it's forcing, remember it, a virus injects DNA or RNA that gets read and remember it takes over the protein synthesis process. So the cell is no longer making proteins that the cell wants, it's now making proteins that the virus wants. But since there's now these viral proteins inside of the cell, they can bind to the major histocompatibility complex and it can be expressed on the surface. And this is a way that we can tell the body that this cell is now infected. Basically what this cell is saying, let's do this in red, is it saying, hey, look what I'm making. All right, this doesn't belong, kill me. That's basically what this cell is saying. I am being forced to make proteins that are not for me. I am infected, kill me. Okay, and this, this cell is incapable of bursting. If left alone, this cell will fill up with viruses, will burst and release all those viruses increasing oh. our infection, which is a bad thing, which is why this cell wants you to kill it. It yeah. wants you to kill it before it can make those viruses and release them. Got it. Okay, that helps. So how, how far along the process this is? I mean, is this like immediately or does this happen within days uh, of uh, getting the virus? It takes a little bit of time. Again, what protein it grabs and expresses on the surface is gonna be random. So obviously the more uh, viral proteins it has in it, the more it'll be expressing on the surface and the more likely you will get an immune response. And remember, expressing it is just a way of saying, hey, I'm infected, kill me. Remember, we still need the T cell to come and be activated by it. And we're talking about like disorders, like you said, diabetes, perhaps yeah. lupus, or- yeah. What we are talking okay. about here is you getting the cold, you getting the oh. coronavirus, you okay. getting the flu, things like that. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So is this like the only, like the major purpose of the major histata, that is a hard thing to say, major histatability complex is to express these proteins so that if it's not supposed to be there, the T cells can get rid of it? Exactly. Got it. That's why it's so important that the T cells undergo that positive selection. Because if they can't recognize the type one major histocompatibility complexes, they won't be able to recognize a cell that has been infected and they won't be able to help us. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That is type one, but notice there is a type two major histocompatibility complex as well. The cells that express our type two major histocompatibility complex are the phagocytes. And then of course, this is also the dendritic cells 
this is also the um, like the Kufer cells, those other cells as well. But these are not the normal cells. Think about what this phagocyte does. The phagocyte's job is to grab things, break them down, right? If you are normal and healthy, does that mean your phagocytes don't do anything? No, not necessarily, because there may be some cell that died and needs to, you know, some debris that needs to be gotten rid of, right? Or, you know, an older cell dies and needs to be broken down and, and reestablished. But basically, its job is to grab things and break them down. These phagocytes express the type 2 major is the compatibility complexes in the same kind of way. They make these proteins and they express them on the surface and anything that they've gobbled up, they're gonna go ahead and grab and express on the surface. So if they've broken down one of our cells, there may be a little bit of one of our cells proteins that it's hanging out and it's gonna express on the surface and it's not gonna be a big deal. However, what happens when this phagocyte gobbles up a pathogen? When the phagocyte grabs, oops, this one, I want this right, eats a pathogen, as we talked about, it breaks it down. And when it breaks it down, it will take some of its antigens and bind them with our major histocompatibility complex. So again, it's going to have gobbled up that pathogen, taking a piece of that pathogen and bind it to our major histocompatibility complex, which it will then express on its surface. So now we have a type two major histocompatibility complex. All right, whoever's drying their hair, I'm gonna go ahead and meet you guys, but feel free to unmute as needed. Thank you. No worries. Look, I, look, I, I certainly appreciate the need for good hair care. So, I mean, I understand uh, the need for that, but uh, it doesn't necessarily need to disrupt the class. All right, excellent. So notice, once again, we are expressing a self part and a non-self part. On its surface. In this type two major histocompatibility complex. Oops, I did not write. But there's a big difference with this type two one. Notice in this case, this is an external antigen, right? This cell didn't make it. It found it and ate it. And now is expressing it on surface. So if you think about it, what this cell is saying is, hey, look what I found. This doesn't belong. Go kill, go kill it. Mommy. Mommy, Dad. I don't like that either. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Yeah. So in this case, is it the external cell, uh, uh, sorry, the external um, antigen that will be destroyed? Because the first, in this first case, the, uh, the normal health cell would destroy to give you a self part and a non-self part. So it's so again, absolutely. I think you've got the right idea. 
with the, with the type one, the type one is expressing what we call an internal antigen. Exactly. This is a cell that it is making. So if you think about it, it's making it basically for one of three reasons. It's making an abnormal antigen for basically one of three reasons. Oh, this doesn't have to all be in caps, but I'm not gonna bother rewriting it again because I'm gonna erase this in a second. It's either because it's infected and the virus is making it do it. It could be cancerous because if it's cancerous, then typically we make abnormal proteins. Or as we talked about, it could be a transplant planted cell. If it's a transplanted cell, it's normal for that organ, just not normal for us. And that's the problem. If we recognize it as not being normal for us, that's when you reject that transplant. So with the type one, it is expressing that internal antigen, something that it's making on the inside and so there's something wrong about it. And that's why this cell expressing that non-us antigen in a type one major histocompatibility complex needs to be killed. Over here, our phagocyte is expressing an external antigen. It didn't make it, it found it. So even though it's expressing it on the surface, is it saying, hey, kill me? No, it's saying, hey, go find this and go kill it. So that's really the difference between these two. One is saying, I'm making this, this is not right, kill me. The other is saying, I found this, this is not right, go kill it. And so those are our two types of major histocompatibility complexes. Now, your book actually does a pretty good job of describing this. Hold on a second. Do this first. So our class one, type one major histocompatibility complexes, these are the ones that are infected, uh, expressed by all cells, but where why we care is if it's an affected cell, right? Because if it's an affected cell, it's expressing that wrong, that non-self internal antigen. And here's the pretty picture that kind of shows how this works. Notice our cell is being made to make viral uh, proteins. Some of those viral proteins are, and again, you don't need to know all the steps in this process, but I'm showing this how this works. Some of these abnormal proteins bind to that class one major compatibility complex and is expressed on the surface. Oh, great question. So an infection, when an infection goes away, you are, it doesn't mean that there hasn't been any damage or you haven't killed any cells, but the goal is to get rid of enough of it where it no longer has an effect. And yes, eventually you will kill all of the pathogens causing the infection and all of the infected cells. And once you've killed all the infected cells, once you've gotten rid of all the loose pathogens that are around, then you're no longer under attack. So again, the key here is twofold. An internal antigen is made by the cell. And by expressing it, it is saying, kill me. This is different from our class two major histocompatibility complexes, the phagocytes, the Kufr cells, the dendritic cells, and as I mentioned, B cells, but we'll talk more about the B cells later. These express an external antigen, right? They didn't make it, they found it. And they instead are saying, hey, this is running around inside of our body, go kill this. So notice how this one works. Here we have that endocytosis that we know takes place with phagocytosis. The lysosome binds to it, breaking it down. But notice here we have another vesicle. And again, I don't care that you know the steps of this. I just, I think this picture helps to illustrate the point. 
This class two major histocompatibility complex is able to bind one of these antigens from that pathogen and express it on the surface. So it is expressing an external antigen, something it found from the outside. All right. Questions on that? All right, I appreciate this information is dense. This is a good stopping point. I'm gonna come back to our picture because we're gonna need it in a minute here. Uh, but I think this is a good stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our first break here uh, so that we stay fresh for this uh, as best much, much as possible. It's nine o'clock now, so we will restart at 9.15 and I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions on this before we take our first break? I have a question. Is it yes. possible for the phagocytes in the dendritic cells to express in a type one way? Yes, uh, some phagocytes will have type one as well where they're expressing their own proteins, but if they were to become uh, infected, then they could potentially express that foreign and could be destroyed, but not all of them do. So that is one of the challenges with this. Yep. All right, great question though. Yeah, they, again, I know I've drawn the type one and the type two similar because they're both major compatibility complexes, but obviously there are gonna be molecular differences. And I'll give you a hint going into what we're going to um, talk about going in next. The two, whoops, the two types of major histocompatibility complex bind to the two different types of T cells. So yes, there are some molecular differences in them that actually allow only one type of T cell to bind to each of them. And heck, we'll go ahead and do it now, right? The type two are the ones that bind to the helper T cells. And the type one are the ones that are gonna to bind to the cytotoxic T cells. So we'll see exactly how that works after the break. But yes, absolutely. There are molecular differences in them that allow them to bind to different types of T cells and allow them to give different messages. Kill me or go kill this. So yeah, they are molecularly different. Great question. Any others? All right, perfect. Let's go ahead and take our break then. Uh, come back, like I said, at 9.15 and 9.15, we'll pick up from there. I'm going to go grab my coffee. You grab yours because we still got a ways to go today. All right, see you guys in a bit. Okay. So, again, I appreciate that this is uh, uh, dense material, so it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, so again, I want to make sure that everybody's understanding this. And if you're not understanding this, please, please let me know uh, so that we can uh, make sure you understand it because everything we're going to continue to talk about keeps going layer upon layer upon everything else. So I want to make sure uh, this makes sense before we go any further. So any questions about the two types of major histocompatibility complexes, what cells express them, what type of antigens present them and what the message they're saying by presenting those is. All right, stunned silence means we've totally mastered the information, let's move forward. So now our goal of having these express these on their surface are of course to activate our T cells. As we know, our T cells, and so this will be a T cell. Um, is got to have a binding site that can recognize the major histocompatibility complex. Remember this is, we know this is true because of that uh, positive selection. So obviously the positive selection uh, allows it to know, we know it can bind to 
the major histocompatibility complex because of that positive selection. Because of the negative selection, we know that it's not going to recognize any of our antigens, but there are going to be lots of different types of T cells with different shape binding sites. And in and this, this case, the cytotoxic T cell? Doesn't matter for both. Um, and in this case, that specific binding site is going to be, and let's use pink just to make it a little bit very, right? Triangle shape. Now, quick question. What determines what shape the binding sites are of these T cells? The major histocompatibility complex? No. So what you've got all these T cells. You've got T cells, I've got T cells, she's got T cells, he's got T cells, everybody's got T cells. Some of them are going to be triangle shaped, some of them are going to be circle shaped, some of them are going to be square shaped, some of them are going to be rectangle shaped, some of them are going to be star shaped. What determines what the shapes are of your T cells? Antibodies. Well, it's going to say again. Antibodies? Nope, genetics. Remember, that's the innate immunity. This is determined by genetics. The genetics determine which of these T cells you have, what their shapes are going to be, what you're going to be protected from. Absolutely. So remember, I'm going to beat that dead horse. Our starting point from all of this are the genes you got from mom and dad. Question. Yes. So, but you said it's genes, but would this also include T cells getting created from um, memory cells? I guess that would then say, hey, make this new, I guess, uh, shape or whatever. Well, so memory cells make the same shape. So notice here, I've got the triangle. So after I've been infected by this triangle pathogen, I'm going to build memory T cells that are going to be triangle pathogen T cells as well. So that if I ever come against this triangle again, I can have a bigger, stronger, faster, longer response to that triangle pathogen. But it's not going to help me against a circle pathogen. It's not going to help me against a square pathogen. Now, remember, when we get exposed to things, if we don't have that particular shape, we can, right, using that exposure, produce it, right? We do have that ability to get that, that acquired immunity, but the starting point for all of this is going to be the genetics. Okay, so here we've got this double binding or what we call a double recognition. where this T cell is able to bind to both the self and non-self protein. It binds to the major histocompatibility complex. It binds to the antigen, right? So the self is the uh, major histocompatibility complex and the non-self protein is the antigen. All right, with me so far. Now, this binding of these two things together in and of themselves still doesn't activate our T cell. Back in ancient times, there were things called cars, which we would use to get to and from school and work. All right, you may vaguely remember cars. We used to be able to drive around in them. And in really ancient times, there were things called keys, right? A key was this little piece of metal that you would insert into the steering column of the car to be able to turn it on. I know all of you have fobs now or chips in your head, hand or whatever it is that can start your car now. But in ancient times, you had this metal key and this metal key slid into the slot. However, when you slid that key into the slot, did the car instantly start? You had to turn the key. You then had to turn the key. So just binding, sticking the key in there, even though it fit perfectly because it had the right shape to it, that still wasn't enough to start the car. And the same thing is true here. 
this double recognition is not enough to activate our T cell. Our T cell is now sensitive. It's been sensitized, but to actually activate it, and so let's pick a different color. What haven't I used yet? We'll use uh, purple. Purple. There you go. Nope, I don't want this to be. To finally activate the T cell, one more thing is required. And that one more thing is what we call the co-stimulation. This co-stimulation is either a protein or a chemical signal that is released from the, in this case, infected cell or from the phagocyte. So let's cheat and do this. So like I said, it could be a chemical signal that is released from this and stimulates it, or it can be a plasma protein that is on the surface that is able to stimulate it. So it can be either a plasma protein or it can be some kind of chemical signal that is released. But when all three of those things occur together, the binding of the self, the binding of the non-self, and that co-stimulation. When all three things occur together, finally, our T cell is activated. All right. One more time, the three things are the correct shape of the um, MHC, the double recognition and the co-stimulation? Well, no, the double recognition is the first two things. The double recognition is the recognizing of the major histocompatibility complex and the recognizing of the antigen. So both the self and the non-self, that double recognition. So those are the first two things that are occurring. But at the same time that we're getting that double recognition, we also need that co-stimulation. And yeah, Christopher, that is the one advantage of getting the vaccine. When you get the vaccine and you get that, uh, that chip that Bill Gates put in there, it will actually allow you to start your car automatically. So that is gonna be very nice. It'll be convenient that way. So does this co-stimulation happen spontaneously? Yes, the binding of the T, if the cell is infected, when the binding of the T cell occurs, then we get that chemical signal that is released. So it's like I said, it's like putting the key in and then turning the ignition. When you get all of those things happening together, obviously if you try to turn the ignition without a key in it, nothing's gonna happen. If you just put the key in there, nothing's gonna happen. But when you put the key in and turn the ignition at the same time, that's when the magic occurs. <laughs> that's great, Daniel. I love that. That is spectacular. I miss that little paperclip guy. What was that called? He had a name, didn't he? Didn't the little uh, the paperclip guy from uh, Word and all that from, uh, didn't he have a name? The little paperclip of the eyes. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Don't make me look it up during the next break. Somebody's got to have to know the name. Clippy. 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 Oh, there you go. Okay, excellent, excellent. I was going to say, I was going to have to look it up during the next break if nobody could come up with it. Awesome. Spectacular. That is awesome. Excellent. All right. So we have our active T cell. Questions on that? Because like I said, we got to add another layer. So I want to make sure this makes sense before we go any further. Okay, this so. The same process, I mean, you were just using it, um, drawing onto the, um, the self type one, this exact same thing happens with the type two? For the, the most three. part, absolutely, <laughs> exactly. And that's actually the point that I wanted to move to next. So you are absolutely correct. As I have already hinted at, 
So now I give myself a little bit more room. So I can move oh, this non-self part. Let's erase that because that's not right. We need it to be red. We don't want to capitalize. And because I'm anal, let's change that. on this side. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. So let's draw a second T cell. This second T cell also needs to have the part that allows it to recognize the major histocompatibility complex. It has to have the part that allows it to recognize the triangle antigen. It is also, as we know, going to be receiving some type of co-stimulation. From that to be activated for this T cell. But as we already talked about, there are two different types, major types of T cells that are going to be affected by these two major different types of major histocompatibility complex. And as I mentioned, the type that is going to bind to the type 2 is the helper T. And the type that binds to the type 1 or class 1 major histocompatibility complex is the cytotoxic. So then the question becomes, how are there different types of T cells? Well, T cells, like most of the cells in the body, have a lot of proteins. T cells have lots of proteins on their surface. Fancy ones known as CD markers. And there are over 30 of these that can be found. Now, does that mean that every single T cell has all 30 of these? No, they're gonna vary by type, sort of. There are some CD markers that all uh, T cells are going to need. So for instance, for a T cell to be active, it must have the CD3 marker on it. Oops. So pretty much if you are going to be a normal, fully functional T cell, you have to have this CD3 marker on your surface. However, others are going to vary from T cell to T cell. And two of the more important markers that we could have is CD8 and CD4. Our cytotoxic T cells are the only ones that express CD8. And because they have CD8, they're actually called CD8 T cells. It is this CD8 marker that is the special protein that allows it to bind to the class one major histocompatibility complex. I didn't leave myself enough room to write this, so let's cheat. Move that up, move that up, move that up. 
and I may even have to write it smaller. So it is that CD8 marker that allows this cell to bind to the class one major histocompatibility complex. Whereas our helper T cells, well, these express the CD4 marker. So not surprisingly, they're called CD4 T cells. And again, this allows them to bind to the class two major histocompatibility complex. So someone was asking earlier, Daniel was asking earlier about how, uh, are there molecular differences between the class one and the class two? Yes, absolutely. And it is these differences in these CD markers that allow them to be different in the way that they bind. And so let's just make it a different shape just for the heck of it. So there is that CD4 marker that is expressing that allows it to bind to the class two major histocompatibility complex. So each type of T cell can only bind with one type of major histocompatibility complex. And here's the way I always remember it. CD8 binds to class one and eight times one equals eight. CD4 binds with class two and four times two equals eight. So CD4 binds with class two, CD8 binds with class one, and then they're matchy match. Now I've made a bit of a mess of my board here, which I always love. I love making a mess of my board, but let's like look, la, la, la. let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. So, our T cells bind to a specific major histocompatibility complex, either on that affected cell or on that phagocyte. But remember, as we talked about that double recognition, right? Because that's what this is. This is that double recognition. By itself is not enough, right? Because we don't want to inappropriately activate these T cells. T cells kill other cells. We don't want, that's not a mistake we want to make. We don't want to accidentally start that car by accident. So we require that co-stimulation. All right. And again, some of them include plasma proteins. Some of them include just chemical signals that are released. And so when we get that double recognition, the self, the non-self of the double recognition, and the co-stimulation together, then that T cell is gonna be activated. Of course, which T cell gets activated is determined by which major histocompatibility complex it is and by which CD markers those T cells have. Oh, see, there you go, over 70 types. So I, under, I undersold it. Like I said, all T cells have to have that CD3 that allows them to be activated. If they don't have that, they can't divide. But other markers vary by the types. Some T cells have the CD4. And so again, we call them CD4 T cells. And these primarily become what? What did we say that the CD4 cells become? Helper T cells. Helper. And that's actually how I remember it. Four letters in help. So this, the CD4s become the helper Ts. And then our CD8 
T cells. Primarily become cytotoxic, which as you can see actually has eight letters in it. So that helps you to remember it as well. Does it have eight letters in it? Nobody bought it to count. It doesn't, but it's more than four. <laughs> uh, I counted. <laughs> okay, so maybe not. Excellent. And again, if you don't like my pretty pictures that I've been drawing, here's the pretty picture from your textbook. Notice this one up here is an infected cell. This infected cell is expressing a internal uh, antigen on its surface in its class one major histocompatibility complex. So here's the class one major histocompatibility complex and there's that internal antigen. Here is the receptor on the T cell, which recognizes the major histocompatibility complex and recognizes the antigen. We have that double recognition. Notice to be able to bind to this major histocompatibility complex, it had to have the CD8 proteins that allowed it to bind. But remember, this double recognition is not enough. We still need that co-stimulation from the affected cell. And so when all this comes together, this T cell is gonna become active and primarily, and I wanna keep emphasizing that, form cytotoxic T cells. Notice I keep saying primarily because there are going to be some others. And as it turns out, I'll go ahead and tell here, a few will form our memory cells and a few will form our regulatory cells. So we can form some regulatory and memory cells this way, but most of the cells that are activated this way become our cytotoxic T cells. So again, bind to the class one, major is the compatibility complex. Uh, yeah. And I'll save this image and uh, post it on, uh, oh no, oh, <laughs> I almost cleared it. Uh, save this image and, uh, and uh, uh, post it on, uh, post it on uh, our website, Canvas. All right. Let's take a look at the next one. Our CD4 are the ones that primarily form the helper T cells plus the memory and the regulatory. Where's my picture? Oh, there it is. So again, notice in this case, the cell is a phagocyte. And it is expressing a external antigen so thought, notice go ahead i thought that cd8 t cells helped form the memory and regular regulatory t cells both helper and cytotoxic produce memory and regulatory t cells so both so again this are primarily going to be helper T cells, but we're also going to get memory and we're also going to get regulatory. So both memory and regulatory are both cytotoxic and helper. Or from them, anyway, CD4 and CD8s. So again, notice here we see our phagocyte with its class two major histocompatibility complex expressing that foreign antigen. Our T cell has is able to recognize the major histocompatibility complex, is able to recognize the antigen, 
it is able to bind to the class two because it has the CD4 protein. However, notice our illustration here, LAX is missing that co-stimulation. So our picture here forgot to put it in here. We still need that co-stimulation to truly activate uh, this CD4 T cell. So our pretty picture here forgot that, but here we have it. So three things are needed, right? We need to recognize the self in the matrix to compatibility complex. We have to recognize the antigen. That's what we call that double recognition. But double recognition isn't enough. We also need that co-stimulation. And the keys so in, the, go ahead. In autoimmune disorders, are just a lot of T cells being activated by this process or is this process not occurring correctly and too many are being activated? Well, so that's a great question. And here's the problem. It only takes one T cell because as we're gonna talk about, if you have one bad T cell that recognizes a normal antigen, when these T cells all T cells are activated. The first thing they do is multiply. So they divide rapidly producing dozens, if not hundreds of these. So that's the problem. It's one of the issues that not just with autoimmune disorders, but like my daughter's allergy. She has a hypersensitivity where she has that allergy to that special protein in a peanut. And as we talked about, it can't cause the cells to divide, but it can cause the cells to react. The problem with these types of allergies is that she could be exposed to a peanut and have very minor symptoms. And the next 10 times she gets exposed, she could have minor symptoms. But if something else has caused memory cells or a large amount of these cells to be made, then who's to know on the 20th time she's exposed to that peanut protein, she could have a big, huge, massive anaphylactic reaction, right? Because it, the problem is, is it's activating the cells. The cells are reacting to it. Yeah, well, there are better things in life like alcohol, I can survive without milkshake. I, again, looking at me, you can clearly see I have many vices, but sweets aren't one of them. I, I, sweets don't bother me. I'm, I'm, I'm a bread and beer kind of guy. Those are, those are the ones that have formed the body that you see before you. So uh, the sweets don't bother me. <laughs> True, yeah. although I don't think uh, Chick-fil-A uh, uh, um, uh, serves them that way. So I think they have to modify it somehow with that. But so there you go. Here's the pretty picture, we digress. So again, whether it is the CD8, whether it is the CD4, the first thing that happens when that cell is finally activated is that the cell divides rapidly, producing many daughter cells, most of which form those active cells. And again, CD8s become the cytotoxic and CD4 become the helper. But again, most is not all. So there are a few that stay inactive and those that stay inactive become the memory cells. And then there are a few that activate slowly. And those that activate with a delay are gonna be the suppressor cells. And let's think about that for a second. Obviously we want the memory cells to stay inactive because the whole point of memory cells isn't to help us with this infection, but to help us with the next infection. I think that one's intuitive and that would make sense. But why do we want to delay the suppressor or the regulatory cells? Why don't we want those activated right away? So that it can create memory? Well, not just so that it can create memory, but so they can do their job, right? 
if you're in a dark room and you turn on the light to read, do you instantly want to turn the light off right after you turn it on? No, you want to wait till you're done reading. And then when you're done, you turn off the light. We don't want to activate all these T cells to protect us from a harmful pathogen and then immediately start turning them off. We want to wait till they've had a chance to do some work. And once they've done their work and they've done that, then with that delay, finally, after they've done their work, we want to start worrying about shutting it down. So yeah, we want to give it time to do its job. So there you go. Some are going to stay inert, become memory cells, and then they're also going to have those that become the regulatory ones as well. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. It's a long way to go, but we've finally gotten to the point where we figured out how to turn on a T cell and which T cells get turned on by what. So then the next question becomes what happens when they are activated, All right? So let's talk about that. Starting first with the cytotoxic T cell. Again, notice here we see all the steps involved in that activation. We have that double recognition. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> we have that co stimulation, right? Make that smaller. We have that double recognition. We have that co-stimulation all going on here. And it is activated. And as we said, when it is activated, the first thing it does is undergo this rapid division. All right? We get this rapid division producing identical cells. And by identical cells, I mean they all have the same binding site to the specific antigen, right? That is the power of this. This is that powerful uh, um, system that is able to, that's a little tiny, uh, that powerful system where we're able to be precise, specific, scalpel defense to this. Now, as we talked about, most of them become cytotoxic T cells, but there are a few that will become memory and suppressor. Or again, we can use the term regulatory. Um, I keep saying suppressor because uh, the, the, the story of these suppressor and regulatory cells, we'll talk about them a little bit more a little bit later. Uh, is uh, interesting. And for the longest time, they call them suppressor. And I think they're moving more and more towards calling them regulatory. But uh, both terms are still fairly uh, common. So it's fine that way. So there are a few memory cells. There are a few suppressor cells that are going to be formed. But the majority of them are going to become these active cytotoxic T cells. And remember, as we talked about, these are the cells that destroy other cells. That does not look right. That destroy, that doesn't look right to me. Uh, other cells, All right? So this was activated by a cell that was expressing that class one major compatibility complex with the specific antigen on its surface, that triangle that we started from. So what's gonna happen is our active T cell used with that identical binding site is going to come and bind to and find this infected cell. And it wants to destroy it. And it's going to destroy it in a similar way to those natural killer cells. It is going to release proteins. And these proteins that are released 
can poke a hole in the plasma membrane, allowing salt and water to come in. It's gonna release chemicals that are gonna come in and cause the destruction of the DNA, destroying the DNA, eliminating the ability of this cell to continue to make new proteins, make new viruses, and it can trigger apoptosis. Right? These are the similar kind of things that we saw the natural killer cell did. The difference is instead of just one security guard, we have a whole infiltrate of these cytotoxic T cells that are gonna come and do that job. So notice here, we see it binding to it, destroying that cell, and then moving on to the next. These cytotoxic T cells, remember, the only cells that can directly attack other cells. They find which cell they're attacking by the one that is presenting the specific class one major histocompatibility complex and that specific antigen. Notice if you're infected by two different pathogens, pathogen A and pathogen B, if pathogen A excited the T cell, can it kill the second cell that's infected by pathogen B? No, remember it's only gonna be specific to its antigen. And again, virus infected cells, uh, parasitic cells, bacterial cells, cancer cells, or transplanted cells. We keep thinking of this in terms of, again, our normal immune response, dealing with things that are infected. But like I said, this can help us to fight cancer. And this is what causes the rejection of transplants. This is why you can't just pick a liver up off the street and stick it in your body because that liver that you pick up off the street probably is gonna be expressing proteins on its surface that your body's not gonna recognize as being you. And if it recognizes as not being you, it's going to attack it. And again, we've already talked about the ways it's gonna do this. It's gonna poke holes in the cell by releasing a protein called perforin. It's going to destroy the DNA by using a protein called lymphotoxin. This destroys the cell's DNA and of course the cell's DNA and the viral DNA. If we destroy the DNA, if we destroy, then there's no way to make more viruses. And of course, like we said, it can release uh, chemicals like granzymes, which can trigger the cell to undergo apoptosis, where the cell kills itself. What does the lymphotoxin do? Destroys the genetic material inside the cell. So it loses the ability to be able to make both its own proteins, but more importantly, the viral proteins. Now, of course, if the cell can't make any proteins anymore, then that cell is going to die on its own. But we don't want to wait for that to happen. So we can also right use those gramzymes, which I think is the code word for getting on all social medias and telling the person that they're absolutely worthless and they can kill themselves until they finally do. And of course, we've looked at the pretty words. Let's look at the pretty pictures. Ah, sorry, one last thing. It can also sell, cause the cell to produce a second type of interferons. Remember interferons, as we talked about, are those warning signals that tell the nearby cells that there is a viral infected cell nearby. Start protecting yourself. But in particular, gamma interferons actually attract phagocytes bringing phagocytes to the area to cause it to gobble up. These are potent, powerful cells. Targeted cells. Going to find the specific cell presenting the specific antigen and destroy it. Which is why we want to be so careful about 
making them immunocompetent because if they're going to respond to any of our proteins, that could be major trouble. And this is also why we want to have all those fail safes of the double recognition and the co-stimulation and everything else before we turn it on because turning these on inappropriately can cause problems. These are potent, powerful cells. And like I said, we got all the pretty words. Here's the pretty picture that shows this. Interferon is a local chemical mediator, right? Yes. Okay, yep. so uh, excuse me for the bad example, but how come House is always administering interferon to his patients? How does it help if it's administered systemically, if it's supposed to be a local chemical mediator? So um, again, the way it is normally used, and remember this specific one is a gamma one where this gamma, but, but remember we also talked about other interferons that tell our cells to produce uh, antiviral proteins. The way it normally occurs in our body is you get a cut, you have an infection there, the cells that are infected there release that interferon telling the neighboring cells, hey, there's an infected cell in the neighborhood, we need to do something about this, start preparing your defenses, all right? If instead you were to take that interferon and inject it into the entire body, into the bloodstream, where would it go? Everywhere. And so when it goes everywhere, it tells all the cells of your body, hey, start producing some defenses against vaccines, I mean, against viruses, because uh, there's a virus around and you're going to be, um, you know, and it's going to protect you. Now, again, I, I, not my area of expertise, so I don't necessarily know how effective that is. That certainly would increase the overall metabolism. It might have a beneficial effect, but um, my guess is that it's more efficient and effective locally where the infection is, right? If I've got an infection in my arm, it's not really going to matter that my, the cells of my big toe are making defenses against viruses. But if I have some type, especially, you know, again, if you think of it in terms of a show like, uh, like, um, house, it's typically that the person doesn't get to them till they're in a bad way. So if you've got an infection that's no longer just from a recent cut in your arm, but it's spread systemically throughout the body, well, then you need to build up defenses throughout the body. So my guess is that way. And then the other thing too is you got to remember, uh, one of the important things about television is you never let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? So again, just because they use that as a fancy term that they're going to say, it doesn't mean that that's how they normally treat people. But I could see the benefit of it. All right. Questions on this? And notice the other big key to this, like the natural killer cells, once it destroys that target cell, it's off searching for, as it says, searching for another prey. So that is our cytotoxic and what they do the CD8s and all the fun things associated with that. Any questions on that before we move to our helper T cells? Yep, I, I agree. All right, again, I don't know why this picture, uh, again, forgets to show it, but let's not forget that co-stimulation. We need that co-stimulation for the activation of our CD4s. So again, we get the double recognition plus co-stimulation. And when that occurs, we get the activation of our helper T or their CD4 T cell, I should say. And of course, the first thing that happens is we get that massive rapid division. With that massive rapid division, again, most cells that are CD4 become helper T cells, but a few will again stay inactive and become memory, and a few will become regulatory or suppressor T cells. T cells. Not really anything new there. So what we need to talk about is what do helper T cells do to help? Uh, 
And the answer to that question is their goal is to mediate and regulate and enhance the entire body defenses. They increase the cell mediated immunity. They increase the humoral immunity. They even coordinate and enhance our non-specific defenses. That is a massive amount of stuff to do. That is a massive number of cells they need to talk to. So how are they gonna to talk to all of these different cells? Divide. True, we absolutely. One of the things we're gonna divide to have lots of them. Chemicals. There you go. But once we have lots of them, they are going to release lots of chemical signals. And those chemical signals are gonna spread throughout the body and stimulate all these different effects. Now, there are lots of chemicals that are released. And like I said, in micro, you will get more in depth about them specifically. In general, most fall into a class of local chemical signals. So actually, really, these are local hormones. And this class of local hormones are called cytokines. Again, this is a big, huge, massive class of hormones that I'm not going to spend time talking about because you'll get that in micro. But they're these big, huge, massive uh, local hormones that are released and communicate to the cells around them. So the questions then become, what do these cytokines do? Well, one of the first things they do is they actually stimulate themselves. Right? They're actually what we call autokines, where they actually stimulate themselves. So we get more division and get more helper T cells. Is the more helper T cells mean more chemical signals. Then, like I mentioned, they are going to stimulate the cytotoxic T cells to divide more rapidly and mature more rapidly. Divide and mature more rapidly. So we get more direct defense against infected cells. They are going to stimulate our B cells, which we haven't even talked about yet, to divide and uh, mature more quickly. Well, just divide and, and, and mature. Say it this way. In fact, most B cells cannot be activated. without the helper T's. Oops, that was three. And like I said, it is going to coordinate and enhance our nonspecific defenses. Massively, massively important cells. Thank goodness there's nothing that targets and attacks these helper T cells. Because if there was something that targeted and attacked these helper T cells, that would be a truly devastating condition. But luckily, nothing like that exists, right? Weird. It almost sounds like something like that exists. Does something like that exist? I think something like that does exist. HIV. Yeah, HIV, exactly. HIV, that, that virus, HIV virus. And again, I don't want to steal too much of the thunder because someone in our group is, someone in our class is doing that as their group presentation. 
but absolutely the HIV virus targets and destroys these helper T cells. And without those helper T cells, you basically don't get an immune response. So again, coordinate the immune response, release those cytokines, stimulates the helper T cells themselves to divide, stimulates the cytotoxic T cells to mature more rapidly, enhances our nonspecific defenses, triggers the B cell activity. Like I said, vitally, vitally important cells. And here we have it with all the pretty words. Here we have it with the pretty picture. Notice here's our helper T cell being activated by the antigen presenting cell. Notice, I love this picture. It's such a simple picture, but it does such a nice job of really showing us everything we need. Notice here we're getting the double recognition of the class two major stick compatibility complex and its antigen and the co-stimulation. When activated, it doesn't show the division, but it does show how it's going to produce chemical signals that will enhance its own development, enhance the cytotoxic T cell maturation and development, enhance B cell activating our B cells, and enhances our nonspecific defenses. So for such a simple illustration, I think it does a pretty good job of showing us how these helper T cells work. All right. And again, without those helper T cells, there is no immune response. I will leave us with this for our next break. Here is a pretty picture. Actually, that's, I lied. We're going to talk about one more thing. Yep. So notice again, our class one major histocompatibility complexes activates our CD8 T cells. They are expressing an internal antigen on their surface. And that CD8, when activated, most become cytotoxic T cells, but a few become membrane suppressor. Our class two major compatibility complex expresses that external antigen and activates our CD4, which become helper T cells, most, but some memory and also some suppressor T cells. As I said, the story on these suppressor T cells is interesting. It's changed many times. When they were first discovered, it was believed that they solely came from the class uh, CD4 T cells. Then research showed, no, no, they actually come from the CD8 T cells. And then further research showed, no, no, they come from both. So our current belief is that both CD8 and CD4 T cells produce suppressor uh, or regulatory T cells. Now, again, you may be wondering why it is uh, that we don't know these things, but you got to remember what we're dealing with here. We are taking this big whole trillion celled organism that is us, and we're trying to understand what these tiny little cells inside of our body do. We don't even fully understand our normal immune response, right? When we look at things like autoimmune disorders, where our body is attach attacking our own cells, we barely understand that in many autoimmune disorders, we don't know the cause of them. So we don't even know how our regular immune response works, let alone how we turn it off. It is very, very challenging to see and understand the cells and the chemical signals that are used to be able to uh, regulate or suppress the activity of our T cells. We do know some things. We definitely understand that they are much slower to activate as we talked about that is definitely important because it gives the T cells time to do their job before we turn them off. We now understand that it likely comes from multiple strains. So it is formed by both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Oops, that's not an eight. They are most poorly understood 
But these are things that we are spending billions of dollars every year to be able to understand how they work. You can kind of understand why they thought it, they first came from the CD4s. Because basically, like the helper T cells, they release chemical signals, cytokines. But in this case, the cytokines are inhibitory. They stop replication of the T cells. They delay or stop the uh, maturation of the T cells. And they actually can trigger apoptosis in the T cells, shutting them off, shutting them down. Again, this is important because it helps us to keep from having a bunch of active T cells running around our body, bored, looking for something to do. Because cells that are bored looking for something to do may attack and destroy our other cells. In fact, there are, I won't say many, but there are uh, uh, several um, biologists, um, you know, scientists who believe that one of the reasons we have such a dramatic increase in autoimmune disorders and allergies over the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years is the increase in the hygiene of the population. As hygiene is approved, as feces is no longer dumped out your window onto the street, right? We are in a more sterile environment. And if we're in a more sterile environment, it's possible they believe that our immune cells get bored looking for something to do and they attack our own cells. So there's they, 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 uh, many people point to the increase, the, 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 uh, the dramatic differences in allergy and autoimmune disorders in industrialized nations uh, versus non-industrialized nations, right? First world versus third world. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, a valid area for consideration. The other important reason to study these is remember we were talking about how this is really good in helping to protect us from pathogens. But the other problem with it is things like autoimmune disorders or allergies or transplants. What if you were able to suppress the T cells that attacked that foreign liver? What if you really could get to the point where you could pick a liver up on the street and stick it in your body? And it wouldn't matter because the cells that would normally attack the, that liver, we could suppress them. If we could turn them off. One of the things that happened to people who get lung, heart, liver uh, transplants, you've got to get that person who's a really, really close match, has proteins that are very, very similar to you. But even when you get that heart, that lung, that liver, you're still on autoimmune suppressors for the rest of your life to help to discourage your immune response from suddenly recognizing that that liver doesn't belong there. And that's great because it lets you keep the liver, but if we're suppressing the entire immune system, that makes you more susceptible to other diseases and disorders, right? It makes you more susceptible to the flu, it makes you more susceptible to coronavirus, things along those lines. So what if we could just target the ones that attack the liver, you would still have a very robust immune response, but you could pretty much take any organ from any person that you wanted and sh shove it in your body. The implications for understanding this is huge, but it is, so it's like I said, billions of dollars are being sent to study this, but it's a very challenging, very hard area of, uh, of research. All right. Questions on that? All right, like I said, I know those of you who have taken micro know that I've kind of only scratched the surface on this, believe it or not. And those of you who haven't taken micro are overwhelmed by all the information. That's kind of the, the good and the bad of this lecture. The people who have had micro are kind of bored because they've had all of this and more, whereas the people who haven't had micro are completely terrified by all of this information and overwhelmed by it. So it's a, it's a non-satisfactory lecture for, lecture for everybody. So I do apologize for that. But with that, that is everything that I'm going to cover from our cell-mediated immunity. So what we are going to do next is switch gears and talk about humoral immunity. However, I went a teeny bit longer than I wanted to, but this is still a good stopping point and not too, too bad. So it's 10.18 now. Let's go ahead and take our second break. 
Before we take our second break, any questions on our, let's go back to the pretty picture. Any questions on our humoral, pardon me, our cellular or cellular immunity or cell mediated immunity before we take our first break, our second break. All righty then, let's go ahead and take our break. It is 1018, so 15 minutes from now is what, 1033? We will start at 1033 and I will start the recording at that part. All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we move forward? You guys have had the break to think about it. Any other questions or concerns about cellular mediated immunity? All right, then let's go ahead and talk about the second branch of our third line of defense, uh, our specific immunity, and that is our humoral immunity, or what is also known as antibody mediated immunity. Again, this is the one that uses the B cells and not surprising based on its name, uses antibodies. We have talked about antibodies a lot since really the cardiovascular system when we were talking about our uh, blood typing exercises. And we've also talked about them being these Y-shaped proteins. But now it's a time to take a little bit of a closer look at our antibody. And again, antibodies yeah, can also be a fancy named immunoglobulins. Those two terms are basically interchangeable. But I want to look at the anatomy of them. Notice they are made up of four sequences of amino acids. Two of these sequences are much longer chains or what are known as the heavy chains. And two of them are made up of the smaller chains or what are known as lighter chains. However, I also want you to notice that there's two other major components to our antibody. If we cheat, and I'll use a box for this one here. Actually, box won't work. So I'll use the highlighter again. Notice the majority of the antibody is this region that is known as the constant region because these sequences of amino acids are identical on every single antibody we make. every single one of them, making this our constant region. Remember, one of the things we've talked about are these are the flags uh, that we're able to use for phagocytes to be able to bind to, for complement proteins to be able to bind to, for all of those types of things. So we want them to be consistent. However, remember, we want this to be able to recognize thousands of different types of um, antigens. So we also have a variable region. The variable region is this part up at the top. It's same for both sides of this. And this is where we get those triangles, those squares, those rectangles, the circles. And again, those aren't really the shape, but this is where we get the variations. And to beat the dead horse, what determines the variations of shapes we have to these variable regions? Genetics. Genetics, excellent. So your genes determine uh, what shapes we are going to have to that. So we have our constant region. Again, four different uh, chains, too heavy, too light. And we have our variable region, which is also known as the antigen binding site. And again, each binding site is unique. And again, each binding site is unique by antibody. What's on the left is the same thing that's on the right. So both of these binding sites, these two binding sites are identical, but one antibody is different from the next antibody. And again, that uniqueness is determined by genetics. All right. 
So this is the basic anatomy of every single antibody you have in your body. And we've been drawing them as Y-shaped with binding sites at the end. So this really isn't anything different from what we've been doing before. We've been basically drawing the Y and that's been consistent throughout. And then we've been drawing the binding sites, right? So again, we've been simplifying it a little bit, but essentially we've been hitting the highlights of this. But there's one other big characteristic about antibodies that we haven't talked about yet is that not all antibodies are the same. In fact, there are actually five major classes of antibodies with five different functions, essentially. The first of these is IgMs. Of course, Ig stands for immunoglobulin. So the first immunoglobulin, M. These are our first antibodies that are typically produced in response to an injury. The primary function of these is to bind our complement proteins and agglutination. Can someone remind me again what agglutination was? Clumping. Yeah, it's the clumping, right? Absolutely. Oops. Right, we talked about how red blood cells would clump together right, when you've added the wrong blood cell in there because the antibodies would clump them together, that clumping of cells. So if we want to be specific, agglutination is the clumping of cells. We often think of it in terms of blood cells, but it doesn't actually have to be blood cells. Blood cells is where we just see it most. But the key is agglutination is the clumping of cells. Our second major class is immunoglobulin A's. These are the ones that are primarily produced by our glandular secretions. These are the ones found in sweat. These are the ones found in saliva. These are the ones that are found in tears. These are the ones that are found in breast milk. Obviously, these help to keep pathogens out of our body but these are also then part of that passive immunity that mom gets to pass on to baby as well. Our third class are the immunoglobulin Ds. These are actually expressed on the surface of B cells. We haven't talked about B cells yet, but I will give you a sneak peek of this. A B cell is a cell. And one of the things that this cell has is it has antibodies on its surface. So maybe in this case, it's circle shape. So this particular B cell will have circle shape antibodies on its surface. Maybe a different B cell will have triangle shape uh, antibodies on their surface. So antibodies are expressed on the surface of our B cells and the types of antibodies that are expressed on our B cells are the immunoglobulin Ds. And I have to erase all of that. So these are gonna play an important role in the activation of B cells, which is something we haven't talked about yet, but we're gonna do next. The most common immunoglobulin are the immunoglobulin Gs. When you are infected, Over 80% of the antibodies that you produce are these immunoglobulin G antibodies. These are the ones that are gonna be responsible for our, uh, primarily responsible, let's say it that way, for our antibody mediated immunity, or what we call our humoral. 
and are actually going to be able to provide what we call our primary and secondary response. Primary, of course, is when we are first exposed to a pathogen. And the secondary response is when we are uh, re-exposed to the pathogen again. These IgG antibodies are, are also able to cross the placenta, which is a good thing in that they provide passive immunity for baby while it's growing inside of mommy. However, if mom is Rh negative and baby is Rh positive, this is where we can start to have some problems as well, where mom's antibodies can actually start attacking baby's blood. So of course, how do we resolve that if mom's Rh negative? Rogam. Rogam. Rogam, absolutely. We give her basically a medicine that helps to suppress the production of those uh, Rh antibodies and helps to protect the baby. Excellent. Lastly, we have our IgE antibodies. These are the ones that mediate inflammation. Basically, oops, didn't mean to do that. I don't know if you saw that, but I don't care. Uh, these are the ones that bind to a cell like a mast cell or a basophil. We know mast cells and basophils are just chock filled with that histamine. We have all that histamine inside of it. And so the question becomes, how does it get released? Well, what happens is these IgEs will actually come and bind to the mast cell, bind to the basophil. And if they have an antigen bound to them, they will activate that mast cell, they will activate that basophil to release the histamine, which again is very useful when it is a harmful pathogen that is causing that problem. But when it is that cut grass from your neighbor cutting their lawn, or you're visiting your friend who has a cat and you're allergic, Right, this can also be where we get those hypersensitivities. The inappropriate release of this inflammation is that hypersensitivity that, so inappropriate release is what we typically think of in terms of allergies. And it is because those incomplete uh, antigens bind to these IgE antibodies, causing the basophils, causing the mast cells to release histamine and you get the runny nose and you get the inflammation of the mucous membranes and your eyes water and all those other things that occur as well. All right, so there you go. Those are your five classes of immunoglobulins. And again, if you need a good mnemonic to remember them, just remember good old Madge, right? She was your first true love right, that 70 year old waitress down at the local diner, right, served you coffee, right, she gave you your first uh, a shot of alcohol, right, those kind of fun things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good old Madge. Excellent. Yeah, made some ridiculous pancakes, absolutely. Right. Is there a specific purpose behind all the different letters? Sure. I, um, my guess is that they picked them for a reason. I don't, I don't know what they are, but uh, I'm sure they gave a reason. I mean, it would make sense for them to be A, B, C, D, and E or something like that. I don't know why they, uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a good answer for you as to why. That's just what they are. Maybe the person who did this really did love match. Now, there's one more important point I want to make. All of these are the five different classes of antibodies. And remember, an antibody subunit 
is that Y-shaped structure. But not all uh, antibodies come as a single subunit. Notice if we look, take a look at the pretty picture, immunoglobulins G, E, and D just come as a single subunit. And of course, this single monomer subunit can each subunit can bind how many different things? How many binding sites does this subunit have? Two. Two. Excellent. But notice the immunoglobulin A, this is the one that is released into the, the uh, secretions of the body to stop stuff that come in. It forms in a dimer where two subunits bind together. How many binding sites does this have? Four. Four things. Remember, its job is to stop things from getting into our body. So by having four subunits, it can bind a lot of things, make them bigger, more awkward structures, make it harder for them to pass through the mucous membranes or have pass through the body and get inside. And remember that immunoglobulin M, which binds complement proteins, but also allows for agglutination, it forms a pentamer. With a pentamer, we have five subunits. And if we have five subunits, how many binding sites do we have here? 10. 10, absolutely. And so you could see where this could grab onto a whole lot of red blood cells and clump them together very efficiently and very quickly. So notice all of them are Y-shaped structures, but that Y-shaped structure is really a subunit for D's, E's, and G's, it's just released as that single subunit. But A is a dimer, and M is a pentamer, giving them different numbers of binding sites. Now, I think we've talked a lot about what um, antibodies can do. Well, actually, I guess we'll do that first. Oh, no, I don't want to do that first. Hold on. Um, where is this in my lecture? Here we go. I'm going to cheat and move this. Then we'll come to the rest of it. OK. We now know the composition of an antibody. We know the classes of antibodies. We know the shapes of those in which they're released and functioned. The other thing that we kind of know, because we've talked about it a lot, but I think this illustration does a nice job of putting it all together, is what it is that antibodies do. Right? And again, there's not a lot of new information on here, so that's one of the nice things, but it does do a good job of emphasizing some of the things we've talked about. One of the things we absolutely positively know our antibodies can do is form, allow for the binding of the complement proteins in that classic pathway. So that classic pathway where uh, C1 binds to the antibody leads to the directed breaking of C3 into C3A, which becomes a chemical signal, C3B, which binds to the plasma membrane and leads to pore formation. And as we know, uh, when that pore forms, that causes the cell to lice and die. But remember that C3A can also attract phagocytes to the area. It can enhance inflammation, right? And things along those lines. We also know that our antibodies can bind things together. When those things are cells, 
we call that process agglutination. But sometimes it can just be the antigens. When the things are water soluble, binding things together is called precipitation, right? But essentially, and now that I've done that, I wanna to totally go back and redo this. Cause I wanna change the colors. Basically agglutination and precipitation are essentially the exact same thing. It clumps stuff together. They're just fancy words. If it is cells that is clumping together, they call it agglutination. If it's some type of water soluble component like the proteins, the antigens, they call it precipitation. But the point is the same. It's clumping a bunch of things together. And when it clumps those things together, it A, stops the spread, limits the damage it can do. But the other thing it does, it becomes a big, huge, obvious clump that makes it easier for our phagocytes to find it and gobble it up. The last thing, and I think we've talked about it, but I don't really remember for certain. The other thing that antibodies can do is they can bind directly to the pathogen itself. Notice this is a virus. And we know this virus needs to bind to the plasma membrane of the cell to get inside, release its DNA, and make all the copies. But if we can coat the outer surface of this with antibodies, that stops it from being able to bind to the cell. It stops it from being able to infect the cell. It stops it from releasing its genetic material. It stops the spread of that virus. That stopping or neutralizing of the virus is another important function of our antibodies. So we knew about complement protein, we knew about agglutination and clumping together, right? Neutralization. And remember, notice all these antibodies are flags and those flags make it easier for the phagocytes to find them and gobble them up. So we've added a couple of vocabulary terms with agglutination and precipitation. And I don't remember for certain whether we talked about neutralization or not, but notice it's going to kill the cell by causing it to burst. It's going to cause phagocytes to be more likely to, uh, to uh, destroy it. They are going to limit the spread, limit the damage that they're going to cause. And with complement protein fixation, they can also help to, uh, to enhance our uh, nonspecific defenses as well. So I think this does a nice job of kind of showing everything that our antibodies do. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Now that we know what antibodies do, let's talk about how we make antibodies, All right? Antibodies are the job of our humoral immune response and again, this is what our B lymphocytes do. We haven't talked about the anatomy of our B lymphocytes, so let's do that. And because it probably will be useful, let's do it here. I don't remember if I've saved this one last time, but let's go ahead and save it now that we've got all of the information here so we can erase that. And let's take a look at a B cell. Here is our B cell. And now that I think about it, I want to move it. B cell here, label there. B cells, not surprisingly, have proteins on their surface. And in particular, what we care about for a B cell is that it's going to have the class two major histocompatibility complex. And remember, it's also going to express the Ig, which Ig, uh, which immunoglobulin does it express on its surface? IgD. There you go. The IgD immunoglobulins on its surface. 
So, class one matrix compatibility complex. We'll put a couple on here. And we'll put a couple antibodies, IgD antibodies on their surface as well. And in this case, we'll stick with triangles because that's what we've been doing so far. However, does every B cell we have express triangles? No. No, some are gonna express squares. Some of them are gonna express circles and horseshoes and stars and rainbows and all the other lucky charms. And what determines what shape the antibodies are? Genetics. Exactly. Told you we were gonna beat that dead horse. Absolutely. Our genetics determine what is expressed on its surface. All right. Now, remember our B cells, unlike our T cells, come in direct contact with the pathogen or at least the anti, uh, antigen of the pathogen. So it could actually bind to the pathogen itself. Here's the pathogen itself. And so it's binding to the pathogen and to its antigen on its surface. But remember also a, a phagocyte could have gobbled up a pathogen. And remember it releases most of its material into the, oh, I did this wrong. I'm gonna cheat, hold on. Oops, I didn't wanna erase all of that. There we go. Oops, no. Okay, so remember, it's also possible that a phagocyte may have gobbled up a pathogen, and remember, it releases most of its material, so it could just come in contact with the antigen by itself. So it can come in direct contact with the pathogen or with just the antigen of the pathogen. When this occurs, what it ends up doing is it basically endocytosis Uh, the antigen. And once it endocytoses the antigen, it is then going to be able to express it on the class two major histocompatibility complex. So basically what's going to happen is it's going to be able to uh, bring this antigen inside. Once it brings this antigen inside, it's then going to be able to express it on the surface of its cell with that class one major, pardon me, class two major compatibility complex. At this point, when this has occurred, this B cell is now considered sensitized. However, for most B cells, this is not enough for activation. There are a few B cells that when, activate, when sensitized, they can automatically activate. But for most Most, oops, most B cells, 
require stimulation from helper T's to be activated. Remember, we talked about how that helper T cell was going to be vital for our immune response. And in this case, most B cells are going to require activation. They can be sensitized on their own. But what we need is for that, nope, that helper T cell be more specific. It's an activated helper T cell. We're not talking about just some random CD4. We need an activated helper T cell to be able to come in and bind to our B cell. When that activated helper T cell binds, it releases cytokines, as we know it's going to do. And it is those cytokines that are released that then activate the B cell. And only then is it activated. All right, questions on that? Done silence. You've either all fallen asleep, I've broken all of your brains, or you've all mastered this material, in which case we can move forward. Excellent. I'll go you've with the broken third. them. <laughs> all right. Excellent. System overload. Okay. Well, so here's the one last thing that I will point out to you. I fully appreciate that this is information overload. This is dense material. This is challenging material. This is hard material. And there's a lot of it. But I will remind you, we don't meet again for five days. So you have five days to synthesize this information and make sense of this information. Uh, come back and look at these lectures again, read it in your textbook if my explanations don't make sense because sometimes hearing it in a different voice makes a difference. I appreciate that this is a lot of information and it's challenging information. I warned you, this is one of the more challenging sections. This isn't like where we get to hold the heart in your hand. Right. Well, you may need to change your plans <laughs> this weekend. That may be a typical weekend, but you may need to take a weekend off from that. So uh, again, because not only do you have to do this, but I'm going to at the end of class today strongly encourage you to start looking again at the endocrine system, because if you think this is bad, the endocrine system is worse. All right. So <laughs> yeah, Mondays for crying, absolutely. So we have activated our B cell. When activated, basically it does the same thing that our T cells do. The first thing that occurs is to divide rapidly and make lots of identical copies. And of course they give a fancy name for this and this fancy name for this is colonal, right? Because we're making clones, colonal selection. And as you should guess, most of these identical uh, daughter cells uh, become active cells. And we'll talk about what those active cells do in a moment, but a few stay inactive. And what do you think those few that stay inactive become? Memory. Memory cells. The active cells grow massive. And they primarily grow massive because they produce a tremendous amount of these interconnected folds of plasma membranes that have these globular components on the outer surface, giving it a very textured, or one might even say rough appearance to it. 
what type of organelle does that sound an awful lot like? Rough and deposit particularly? Absolutely. And remind me again what that rough endoplasmic reticulum does. The only way back in 430, I'd learned the function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. There you go, makes proteins. And not just any protein, but it is gonna make a ton of antibodies. These special antibody making cells are called plasma cells. I've done it here on the board, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Here, notice we have our B cells, our B cell has the class one matrix to compatibility complex, has the IgD antibodies on their surface, and some random antibody that just happens to perfectly fit its binding site binds to it. And what determines the shape of these binding sites? Gene. Genetics. Genetics, absolutely, your genes. Absolutely, your genetics. That gets asked on the exam. Nobody should get that wrong. At this point, it is sensitized. And remember, what it is going to do is it is going to endocytose that antigen and then express it on its major histocompatibility complexes. At this point, it is sensitized, but not active. Only a few B cells are able to be activated by this. Most require the help of that helper T cell. And so here we see it. Our helper T cell comes and binds to the major histocompatibility complex to that antigen. And when it does that, it is going to release those cytokines. And when it releases that chemical signal, it causes that helper T cell, uh, pardon me, that B cell to undergo that clonal selection. Make massive, massive numbers of new cells. A few of those become inactive memory cells, but the majority of them mature into these big, huge, massive cells with massive amounts of rough endoplasmic reticulum so they can make massive amounts of proteins. And I do mean massive. A single plasma cell can produce as many as 2000 antibodies every second. Mm. How many is that in a day? Let's see, 60 seconds in a minute. 60 minutes in an hour, a lot. 24 hours in a day times 2,000. Yeah, a buttload, absolutely, a ton of antibodies, massive, massive numbers. Now, that kind of protein production, is it going to be able to sustain that forever? No. So these plasma cells only last for about four or five days at which point they've completely exhausted themselves. But if you think about it, making 2000 antibodies per second for five days, you're making millions of antibodies before that plasma cell peters out and dies. In which case it'll then be replaced by more. This process being exposed, exposed to the pathogen, being sensitized, being activated by the helper T cell, producing the plasma cells, producing the antibodies. This whole process we've just described is essentially what we refer to as the primary humoral response, right? This is how our B cells are sensitized 
and activated to the first exposure of a pathogen. All right, that is our primary humoral response. And the primary way we measure this is by looking at the number of antibodies produced. All right, let's take a look at the pretty picture here. At day zero is when we are exposed to the pathogen. It takes a little bit of time for the right B cell to find it, right? The right uh, helper T cell to be activated for that right helper T cell to find the right B cell to stimulate the division, to produce the, um, to produce the uh, plasma cells and to have those plasma cells start to produce antibodies. So notice you don't really see a significant increase in antibodies till about day four or five. And notice it takes about 10 days before we reach the peak. Now notice, again, when we're talking about gajillions of antibodies, notice we just use this generic number as what the average is, the units per milliliter of antibody concentration, and just one is the average. So one is the average, it's like atmospheric pressures, one atmosphere, right? So this is one concentration of antibodies. Peaks at around day 10, and notice by around day 28, uh, enough of the plasma cells have died that the antibodies levels are basically back down to where they were before, essentially zero. And if you think about when you get sick, you get exposed to that cold virus. Three or four days later, you start to feel the symptoms. Three or four days after that, you start to feel better. And then by you know the next week or two, two or three weeks, you're feeling normal. And eventually by week four, that uh, virus is completely gone from your body. This is our primary humoral response. So again, let's not forget that word, primary humoral response. And so again, you get a cold, you feel like crap, a couple weeks later, you're back at it again. However, the beauty of this system is our memory cells. During this process, we are also producing memory cells. And the important thing about those memory cells is those memory cells are gonna produce a faster, stronger and longer response if we ever come in contact with that pathogen a second time. So let's do that. Let's expose ourselves to that pathogen a second time. When we get exposed for a second time, we're producing our secondary humoral response. And notice what happens. Again, day one, we are exposed to the pathogen. Or day zero, I say. But notice by day one, just one day later, we've already reached the peak antibody production of where we were before. And by day seven, we're at almost a hundred times what we produced at the peak of the last one. So notice it is faster, it is stronger. And notice by day 28, the first time we were exposed to it, antibody levels were back to zero. Notice now, week two, week three, week four, week five, week six. 
we are still at levels 10 times above what we produced the first time. So not only is it faster, not only is it stronger, but it is longer. And because of this much more aggressive response, right? This is gonna be way too big. Because of the faster, longer, more aggressive response from the memory cells, you typically have little to no symptoms as a result of this. This is why we vaccinate. Because if we can build these memory cells in a harmless environment by just exposing you to the antigen or with the COVID vaccine, by tricking your body into making it for us, we don't even have to inject you with a piece of the, of the virus. We just give you the little bit of genetic material and your body, which is great at making your cells, which are great at making proteins, makes the COVID protein. And your immune cells notice that COVID protein, build up a memory to that COVID protein so that if you ever come in contact with that COVID virus, you get a faster, stronger, longer response, which dramatically decreases the symptoms and makes it much less likely that you're going to have to be uh, hospitalized. Notice it's not producing an impenetrable shield. It doesn't mean you can't get infected by COVID. It doesn't mean your body's not making COVID viruses, so you can still spread COVID. But what it does is it builds up a stronger defense so that the symptoms that you have because of that COVID are much less severe. You can still get infected, you can still spread it, but you're much less likely to have to be hospitalized because of it. All right, so once you get your vaccine, you can't start running around naked. And notice when you get that vaccine, it takes a couple weeks to build up the memory cells. So the day you get your vaccine, you can't start running around naked, at least wait a couple days, a couple weeks. Right. And because it doesn't, because it's a vaccine, it doesn't give as strong of a response, which is why we're finding a second dose. A second dose will build even more memory cells to hopefully give us this big, aggressive, secondary humoral response. Yes, after four weeks, two weeks after your second dose, feel free to run around naked. Yeah, you can still run around naked if you feel, but you're not going to be protected from COVID. All right. Again, to beat yet another dead horse, here's another pretty illustration Oops, that shows this. And again, remember the key to this is that it is only works for the first antigen. You're exposed to antigen A, at about 10 to 12 days, you build up antibodies to A. They go away by week four. You get exposed to A a second time, and you get that stronger, faster, longer response. However, if at the same time, you are also exposed to a second different pathogen, then you're going to get this second pathogen a first response to it a delay, a small amount of antibodies produced, but you'll build up memory cells. And that's the big question about COVID. Is COVID changing so much with all these different variants that we won't be able to recognize it anymore? That's the problem with the flu, right? That's why you have to get a flu vaccine every year because the flu mutates enough whereby a year later, the prominent strains 
don't have the same shape antigens that they did a year ago. So you need a new uh, flu vaccine to protect you from the new versions of it. And there's a lot of doctors that are speculating that COVID is gonna become like that. It's gonna become a yearly thing like the flu where we're gonna have to constantly be getting updates to these vaccines to protect us. Now, the more we're exposed to it, the better our innate defenses will become, but that'll take some time. So COVID, as a lot of doctors are looking at, may be here forever. Why do some viruses do this, mutate, and others don't? It's a great question. The why is, uh, is, is not an answer we can easily, a question we can easily answer. Why it occurs isn't something that's understood. We do understand that those that do mutate, the reason they mutate typically has to do with the genetic material that they have inside. Remember the genetic material are the instructions for making the new viruses, making the new proteins. Well, some of the genetic material in them is, for lack of a better word, sloppy. So what happens then is that when the cell is making the copies, the copies aren't gonna be perfect. And so what that means is that while at first they may have been making triangle shapes, whoops, not what I wanted. They were making triangle shapes on the surface, but because of the sloppy replication, now they're triangle shapes with a dip at the top. They're mostly the same, but a little bit of a variation. Now, as long as our immune cells can still recognize that, then that's okay. But what if the next mutation causes it not just to have a dip, but to have a notch in it? And the next mutation causes it to have a rounded top instead of a pointy top, right? This messiness in the uh, replication of it causes a change in these proteins. And if you think of it from a virus standpoint, if you're a virus whose job is to get make more of you and to continue to survive, having messy DNA is advantageous, All right? We've almost completely eliminated polio because for whatever reason, the polio virus has a very stable antigen, All right? So if it wasn't for anti-vaxxers, we'd be done with polio. Chickenpox is mostly under control now because it's very, it's very stable. So why some viruses are stable and one, why some mutate, that we don't know. But the ones that are stable are much easier to control than the ones that mutate. So the uh, sloppy, uh, is the sloppiness has to do with the host cell genetic how the host material? Cell, how the host cell reads the genetic material and makes the new proteins. Yes, that's what makes, that's what causes the variations. Yep. Got it. All righty, one last illustration again to emphasize this point. Here we have that genetically determined variation to our B cells, a specific antigen to a specific binding site binds, and that one and that one only divides. And all the clones that are produced all are specific to that antigen. Some become memory cells, but most become plasma cells that produce our gajillions of antibodies. However, should we come in contact with that pathogen a second time, those memory cells divide more rapidly, divide more aggressively. Yes, giving us even more memory cells, but more importantly, giving us much more plasma cells, producing much more antibodies for longer and much more rapidly as well. And that second response, right, which can be years later, is typically so aggressive that you're not gonna typically have symptoms associated with it. 
One last picture. I think this is the page number in your textbook, although I think I wrote this on the previous edition of the textbook, so I'm not sure if that's correct or not. But you have this great summary picture that does a good job of really putting all three lines of defenses together into it, kind of showing how they work and how the B cells and the T cells work together and everything else. So it's a really cool picture. Uh, so for those of you who are more visual learners, these are things that can be helpful. All right. Questions on that? Yeah, I have a quick question. It's yeah. Kind of, but when you, uh, you said that it's from genetics, does that mean that when you uh, encounter a virus and you do produce antibodies against it, and when you do uh, have like a kid or an offspring, does that mean it passes down to them? Or do you always stay with the same and the child has to learn how to fight this disease? No, you have the ability to pass it on to your kids. Absolutely. As you, as you produce new types uh, and new variations, then that is something that absolutely can be passed on to your children. Yeah, it's, um, there's a field of research called epigenetics that looks a lot at these types of things. It's really, really interesting. Uh, one of the uh, students who was in my cohorts, uh, one of the one of the a friend of mine that I went to graduate school, who's at Riverside right now, is doing a lot of research on this. Not about the immune system, but she's looking at the effects of alcohol and uh, and alcohol abuse and um, uh, uh, malnutrition and things like that on an individual and how that affects their offspring and the development of their offspring, basically from these big, huge, large uh, global genetic effect called epigenetics. Really, really interesting work, tremendously interesting work. She does some amazing stuff. Uh, it's very, very cool. It's a very interesting field of study that I would have absolutely no interest in doing myself, but she's having a tremendous amount of fun with. All right, excellent. But again, that takes us far, far deeper away from the sky being blue than we need to worry about in this class. Again, your book's got these nice tables that do a good job of talking about the cells and all the function of the cells and all the things that they do and everything that goes along, both the cellular and chemical components of that. So again, spend some time over the next five days digesting this. However, the other thing I want you doing over the next five days is to look ahead at the endocrine system. Because as bad as this is, the endocrine system in some ways could be even worse. Uh, obviously, you already have the lecture slides of what we're going to be going over. But what I really want you to focus on is this handout. This handout is your study guide for the endocrine system. If you look at it, we've spent, we're gonna spend about an equal amount of time in the endocrine system as we do on the immune response and about half that time on the lymphatic. So if you think about the breakdown of the uh, lab and lecture exam, you gotta figure it's about 40% endocrine, about 40% immune response and about 20% uh, lymphatic, maybe a little less. So this is a big part of both your lab and your lecture exam. And this is a handout that is going to help you uh, to be successful. Now, let's start easy with one that I think most people are, are, are familiar with. Notice here, I've got the glands and the hormones that are produced by there. Now, are these necessarily all the hormones that are produced by these glands? No. No, these are just the ones you're responsible for. The anterior pituitary, in fact, produces over a dozen hormones. You're only responsible for these. You'll notice one other thing as well. For instance, like your adrenal cortex, I've got a term and I've got a term in parentheses. When you see that, the big first term is the class of hormones. Classes of hormones, this doesn't need to be capitalized or red for that matter. The classes of hormones. Classes of hormones, of course, are classes that contain many. And in parentheses is going to be the specific example. Typically the most common. So typically that's going to be the most common. So for instance, uh, your adrenal cortex produces a class of hormones called glucocorticoids. 
the most common glucocorticoid is cortisol, right? It produces a class of hormones called mineral corticoids. The most common of those are aldosterone, or let's use one that you guys are probably more familiar with. The testes produce a class of hormones called androgens. And what is the most common androgen? If you're not sure, you should be able to read it off of the screen right now. Testosterone. Testosterone, see how easy that was? There you go. So for some of these, you need to know the classes and you need to know the specific examples. But there are three other pieces of information you need. And again, let's start easy. Most people are familiar with the hormone insulin. Insulin is produced by the pancreas. We'll talk about what cells later. What does insulin target? What kind of cells in the body? Because remember, these are hormones. Hormones can be released into the blood supply. And when they're released into the blood supply, they have the potential to affect every cell of the body. Does insulin affect every cell of the body? Yes. Yeah, well, actually most, not all, but most cells. That is absolutely true. But which ones primarily, which ones are more sensitive to insulin? Thematic cells. Say again? Thematic cells. Uh, let's be a little more specific than that. Muscle cells. There you go. Muscle cells is definitely one. Uh, and there's at least one other area that I can think of that is highly, highly influenced by insulin. Adipocytes. Uh, adipocytes, yep, those work as well. Those weren't the ones I was thinking of, but absolutely adipocytes do as well. And the other one I was thinking of, since you gave me that one, I'll give you the third, liver, the liver cells. So all of the, so you're right, most cells, insulin does affect most cells, not all, but most, but in particular, it is uh, muscle cells, adipocytes, and liver cells are highly sensitive to it. What does insulin do to these cells? What does it tell these cells to do? Oh, Increases their uptake of glucose. There you go, absolutely. Increases glucose uptake. Or if we wanted to get uh, less fancy, but that's 100% correct, it tells the cells to take a glucose out of the blood and store it. Excellent. The third thing we need to know is how they're going to be regulated. Now, in fairness, we haven't had a chance to talk about regulation yet, so it isn't fair to answer this, but let's think of this in terms of something. How, what causes your body to release insulin? When is your body going to release insulin? Any idea? Your blood sugar reaches a certain point. Absolutely. It, with how much insulin we release changes based on your glucose intake, right? You always have a set amount of insulin in your body that's maintained by negative feedback processes. But then you go to that birthday party and you have four pieces of cake and three scoops of ice cream. And they also give you that bag of candy as a going away present. And your glucose levels in your blood spike. So notice what regulates insulin production is going to be glucose levels in the blood. And because this is the level of something in the blood, we have a fancy word for this we say that it is humorally regulated. Remember, humors are the fluids of the body where we're counting how much glucose is in the fluids of the body. And so it is gonna be regulated humorally. And just that easily, we have figured out the targets, the function and how insulin is regulated. And we're gonna do that for all of these hormones. Now, the good news is we're going to do it together. We are going to go through this together and go through this whole list together and work on it both Monday and Wednesday last week. But just like today, it's going to be long. It's going to be dense. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be frustrating. 
So the more you can look at this stuff ahead of time, the less glazed over your eyes will be by the end of the lecture on Monday. So I don't, while I fully expect you to digest your immune response stuff that we went over today, because it was a ton of information and you're gonna need time to make sense of it. I also want you looking forward as well. All right. And the good news is some of these things are pretty easy. Guess what the target of thyroid stimulating hormone is? Thyroid. Thyroid gland, there you go, see? So some of these things are gonna be easy. All righty. Like I said, we will go over this together, but I want you to have an understanding of what's gonna be expected of you, what we're gonna start working on on Monday. So I want to encourage you to start looking at this ahead of time. Any questions on any of that? All right, then thankfully we are finished for the day. I know we've covered a lot of material in a long time. I know we have a whole hour left, so I know you guys are begging me to continue to lecture, but I think the best thing is to just go ahead and take a break at this point, give you time to start digesting and make sense of this information. So I will go ahead, and now that we've talked about the stuff I wanna talk about today, I've warned you about Monday, uh, take a good 15, 20 minutes off, and then I want you diving right back into this material and making sense of it. All right, any questions? All right, then I want you guys to have a good, happy, and safe weekend. Take care of yourselves, take care of your families, be smart, be wise, listen to the scientists as always, and I will see you guys on Monday.